Hey, Wrangle History Unlocked listeners. I'm so excited to share this with you. Today, we've got a guest episode from the incredible series, Klondike Gold Rush History Podcast. The Klondike Gold Rush was a major turning point in Wrangle history. The population boomed, the town modernized, and the effects of it are still visible in Wrangle today. So it's always stumped me. Why would anyone ever come to Wrangle if they were trying to get all the way up into the Klondike? I never truly understood it until I listened to the episode you're about to hear. Klondike Gold Rush History Podcast is a 22-part story of the Klondike Gold Rush, told by father-daughter duo Keith and Pascal Halliday. Released between 2020 and 2021, each episode takes us further into the unfolding story of the Klondike Gold Rush. Pascal and Keith weave together excellent research with stories from their own family history and the ongoing saga of Tappan Adney, a journalist who documented the whole thing. You can find the Klondike Gold Rush History Podcast online at klondikegoldrush.org. What you're about to hear is episode 10 in the series, The Other Routes to the Klondike. Enjoy! Hello, and welcome to the History of the Klondike Gold Rush Podcast, episode 10, The Other Routes to the Klondike. I'm Pascal Halliday. And I'm Keith Halliday. We're taking a short break from following our intrepid journalist and gold seeker Tappan Adney on his way from New York to Bonanza Creek. This episode, we'll look at the routes he didn't take. Although less famous than the Chilkoot Trail or White Pass, thousands chose these other routes. They were as challenging as the White Pass or Chilkoot Trail, sometimes, fatally, even more so. You'll quickly see why we call this episode the good, the bad, and the truly awful. There's a map with the routes on klondikegoldrush.org on this episode page if you want to follow along visually. Let's start with the good, the St. Michael route. You took an ocean-going steamer, perhaps even first class, including nice dinners at the captain's table, from Seattle through the Aleutian Islands to St. Michael in the Bering Strait. This is the west coast of Alaska, facing Russia. Then you transferred onto a flat-bottom, steam-driven riverboat and headed up the Yukon River, passing various Alaskan communities including the gold town of Circle City, and on to the new bustling riverbank at Dawson City. You might remember Circle City from our earlier episodes covering Jack McQuiston and the gold finds before the big one. If you were one of the lucky, or maybe reckless, stampeders who booked a ticket to St. Michael as soon as the SS Excelsior and its golden news arrived in San Francisco, this was great. It was a long journey, but you arrived in Dawson City a few weeks later with your outfit safely in the hold and without even having broken a sweat. But this route wasn't without its downsides. Tickets were incredibly expensive, which earned the route the nickname the Rich Man's Route. And it was seasonal. The riverboats didn't run once the Yukon River froze. That means it was open only June to September. The stampeders who left for St. Michael on the first ships that left after gold arrived outside had a solid chance of making it to Dawson that season but those ships were overbooked. For the SS Excelsior's first trip back to Alaska after news of the Klondike find broke outside, Adney says that more than 10 times more people tried to buy tickets than the ship could accommodate. People who got tickets on the later ships for St. Michael ended up getting frozen in for the winter with their outfits halfway up the Yukon River. Worse things could happen, and often did, as we'll relate when we get to the bad and truly awful routes. But it was still no fun to be frozen in with your outfit hundreds of miles from the gold rush, even if you did have a year's worth of bacon in the hold. If you didn't want to wait seven or eight months for the river to thaw, that meant a grueling overland trip the rest of the distance to Dawson City. And this assumes you made it to St. Michael. In the mania immediately after the gold rush started, shipping companies scrambled to find ships to add to the Alaska routes. Sometimes these ships were unsuitable. Some went so far as to call them the floating coffins of Alaska. Perhaps the most notorious of these floating coffins was the side paddle steamer Eliza Anderson, already 40 years old by the time the gold rush hit. She'd been docked for almost a decade when her owners decided to make a few extra bucks, putting her back in service on the Alaska run. In fact, she'd been serving as a roadhouse and a casino instead of as a steamship and had already sunk once. Just three and a half weeks after news of gold arrived in Seattle, the Anderson had been fixed up and set sail with about 40 passengers who had not been scared off by the rumors she was unseaworthy. 
Too many tickets had been sold, and cramped and angry passengers apparently tried to throw the purser overboard in Seattle Harbor as they loaded. Once at sea, it turned out the ship didn't even have a compass, and the crew bungled coaling in Comox, B.C., causing the ship to crash into another one. While stopping for more coal in Kodiak, Alaska, on the way from Seattle to St. Michael, five frightened passengers refused to even get back on the ship. After Kodiak, a storm hit, and the Anderson, believe it or not, ran out of coal in the middle of the storm. It turned out that the crew had taken it easy in Kodiak and had not actually carried most of the coal into the ship. Panicked passengers divided their time between ripping up anything made of wood to throw into the boilers and writing goodbye letters to relatives to place in whiskey bottles and throw overboard. According to legend, the lifeboats had been swept away by the storm, but the captain gave the order to abandon ship anyway. Just then, a strange figure, said to be the ghost of a previous captain, entered the bridge and steered the ship into a sheltered bay. No one knows for sure, but reports emerged years later that a sailor had foolishly stowed away on the Anderson and Kodiak, and emerged when it became clear that the captain didn't know what he was doing, and then disappeared afterwards. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer reported afterwards that the Anderson was at Dutch Harbor in Alaska, and quote, the impression was that she would never leave there unless to go to the bottom. On our website at klondikegoldrush.org, We've got a page of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer filled with advertising for various ships headed to Alaska. It was clearly a buyer's beware world. Adney reported that some of the Eliza Anderson passengers made it to Dawson City, but their whole ordeal took a year. Adney was told in Dawson that about 1,800 people tried to use the rich man's route. Of these, only 43 reached Dawson before the river froze. The biggest group of the others, about 500 people, spent the winter at an old fur trading post at Rampart, Alaska, only about halfway from St. Michael to Dawson. Even the next year, when more steamers and riverboats were plying the route, it remained more difficult than the easy lines on steamship company maps suggested to get to Dawson City via St. Michael. In 1898, several of the sternwheelers on the river had been beached extra high by the ice and were delayed floating once the ice went out and some steamers were redirected to take troops to the Philippines for the Spanish-American War, which had broken out around the same time. Some passengers were marooned at St. Michael, and the first paddle wheeler of the year with fresh supplies and passengers from St. Michael didn't actually reach Dawson until July 8th of the next year. That's it for the good route. Let's move on to the bad ones. The least bad of the alternatives was probably the Dalton Trail. This left from Pyramid Harbor near Haines, Alaska, also on the Lynn Canal-like Skagway, but a bit to the west, and went over what we now call the Haines Pass before heading cross-country to Fort Selkirk, Robert Campbell's former trading post on the Yukon River. From there, you floated downstream to Dawson. The trail is named after Jack Dalton, a rogue and adventurer who made it famous. Whitehorse historian Michael Gates has written a fascinating book on Dalton that we highly recommend. The thing that makes the Dalton Trail the least bad alternative was that it was a relatively easy route to travel. Dalton took a herd of cattle from Haines to Dawson via the trail, which means it didn't have any extremely steep obstacles like the Chilkoot's Golden Stairs. The problem, however, was that it involved a 250-mile or 400-kilometer hike from Tidewater to the Yukon River, almost 10 times as much walking as the Chilkoot Trail. The Stickeen was another route. You took a ship to Wrangell on the Alaskan Panhandle, then went up the Stickeen River about 150 miles, 250 kilometers, and then crossing back into Canada and heading to Glenora near Telegraph Creek. From there you had an overland slog of somewhere around 150 miles, 250 kilometers, to Teslin Lake. Here you could build a boat, head down the Teslin River, and join the Yukon River on your way to Dawson. The Canadian government favored the Stickeen since it was an all-Canadian route. You could navigate straight from Victoria or Vancouver up the Stickeen River to Canadian soil, although in reality, most people probably did stop and wrangle on the Alaskan side. The Canadian Minister of the Interior granted a contract to build a wagon road followed by a railway from a port on the Stickeen River to Teslin, offering as an inducement huge land grants in the Klondike. Equipment and supplies were sent, and people across Canada and in Europe were even able to buy tickets via the Stickeen route to Dawson. It's another example of Klondike schemes that, through a combination of over-enthusiasm, wishful thinking, and maybe a little bit of con artistry, did not live up to expectations. Adney sums it up like this, quote, 
In all, some thousands of unfortunate dupes ascended the Stikine River to find no railroad in existence and 150 miles of horse trail on which there was insufficient forage for horses. When the embarrassing details came out in Parliament in Ottawa, thanks to some Yukon miners who traveled to the capital to protest against new mining taxes and who were astonished to find out that Parliament was actually debating such an improbable scheme, the bill to enable the railway died. The last of the bad routes is the Ashcroft Trail. This involved taking the Canadian Pacific Railway to Ashcroft in south-central British Columbia, near today's city of Kamloops, and then walking from there. You joined with the Stikine route around Telegraph Creek, and then you could head to Teslin Lake and ultimately to Dawson. This is the route uh, that Isaac Taylor, my great-grandfather and great-great-uncle Will Drury took. They were English, and the Ashcroft Trail had the advantage of being an all-Canadian route, or all-British Empire, as they probably thought of it. It was also cheap. You didn't need to buy expensive steamship tickets or pay high rates per pound for Clingit packers to carry your outfit up the Golden Stairs. For this reason, some called it the poor man's route. The downside was the walking bit, roughly 1,100 miles or 1,800 kilometers from Ashcroft to Teslin. Some of the walking was over well-established routes in the BC interior, often dating back to earlier gold rushes or telegraph lines that had been built decades before. That made pack trains of multiple horses work well. But long stretches of the northern half of the trail were tough hiking through extreme wilderness, like the Stampeders on the Chilkoot Trail or White Pass had to put up with. Except that while the Chilkoot Trail was only 33 miles long, the people on the Ashcroft Trail faced more than 10 times that distance in the wilderness bogs, ravines, and creek crossings on their way to Teslin. According to family lore, there was no shortage of dead horses on the Ashcroft Trail either. There was little fodder for horses on the northern half of the route, and plenty of poisonous weeds. Another downside of the Ashcroft Trail was that it took a long time. If you're supposed to be rushing to Bonanza Creek to stake a claim before everyone else gets there, adding a 1,100-mile hike to your journey puts you at a big disadvantage. Isaac Taylor and Will Drury made it up the trail, but not to Dawson. They ran into a mini gold rush in Atlin, B.C., just a few miles south of the Yukon border. After that didn't pan out, they went to Bennett and went into business as merchants, trading with the Stampeders who had traveled north by ship the same distance they had walked. One of them even gained the rare distinction of doing the passes backwards to Skagway, since they wanted to acquire a sewing machine and go into business at Bennett making sails for the Stampeders building their boats over the winter. Not many people took the poor man's route. We don't really know how many actually went on the Ashcroft Trail, but estimates range around 1,500. We also don't know how many actually made it to the Klondike, but I've seen numbers as low as six. Pierre Burton, a popular historian who spent time in Whitehorse and Dawson in his youth, spends some time in his book, Klondike, on the agony of the Ashcroft Trail. In particular, some of the things the Stampeders left carved behind them. One Ashcroft Trail veteran inscribed the following. This is the grave the poor man fills, after he died from fever and chills, caught while tramping the Stickeen Hills, leaving his wife to pay the bills. Another, even sadder inscription, was left by a German stampeder, who hanged himself from the cross tree of his tent, leaving a note, Bury me here, where I failed. If you think that sounds bad, now we're at the truly awful roots. The first entry in this category is a route that is perhaps the most extreme example of a phenomenon we've seen before. People departing for the Klondike not just not realizing how incredibly arduous the journey was going to be, but also after having been encouraged to do so by official and unofficial boosters. This includes things like Erastus Brainerd and the Seattle Chamber of Commerce encouraging people to go to the Klondike in the hope that they bought their outfits in Seattle or the businessman that Tappan Adney described on his ship, who was associated with the company that owned the White Pass Trail, and who painted a very rosy picture of that trail. The route we're talking about is the Edmonton route. This was another all-Canadian route, and was heavily promoted by Edmonton's civic leaders. As when Adney denounced the opening of the White Pass as a summer trail as not a blunder but a crime, he also had strong views on the Edmonton route, and is worth quoting at length. Note that the mileage numbers he uses are from Canadian government surveyor William Ogilvy. Quote, The insane desire of Canada to find an all-Canadian route to her new possessions has led to the suggestion as possible routes those used by the Hudson's Bay Company to reach the Yukon. 
from Edmonton, a wagon road of 96 miles to Athabasca Landing, thence down Slave River, across Great Slave Lake, and down the Mackenzie River, 1,376 miles to the neighborhood of Fort McPherson, near the mouth of the Mackenzie. Thence up the Rat River and over an all-water connection at McDougall's Pass into the Porcupine. And thence down the Porcupine to the Yukon River, 496 miles. A total distance from Edmonton of 2,398 miles. There, the would-be Klondiker, 303 miles below Dawson and against a hard current, is practically further away from his destination than if at Dye or Skagway. Abney wasn't making this up. Fortunately, relatively few, probably around 1,500, chose the Edmonton route. But those that did suffered extreme hardship and had a lot of time to think about their choice. Even those that made it arrived up to a year and a half later, arriving well after tens of thousands of other stampeders. Adney reported that the number who had reached Dawson by the end of the summer of 1898 could be counted on one hand, and these had left most of their outfits way back around McDougall Pass. There was another variant of this route, following the first route Robert Campbell used to get to the Yukon watershed. That is, up the Liard River, then over the Continental Divide around Francis Lake, and then to Pelly Banks and the Pelly River. As this route was so difficult even the Hudson's Bay Company stopped using it, relatively few stampeders chose this way. There are reports of a number of individuals leaving Edmonton to do it, but when Adney was in the Klondike, he had not heard of a single individual making it. The boosterism of the Edmonton business community, as well as some other Canadian officials, makes Erasmus Brainerd in Seattle look like a responsible travel advisor in comparison. Adney was told that around 2,000 people tried one of the Edmonton routes, and he estimated 500 would die along the way from exposure and disease. His view was harsh, saying that this was the price that the Canadian government paid for so desperately wanting a Canadian route— going on to say, quote, With full knowledge of the situation, obtained through its own surveyors, it should have sounded a note of warning instead of giving it public approval as it did by official maps and reports. In a bizarre footnote, instead of being embarrassed by the episode, Edmonton until recently had an annual festival it called Klondike Days, which celebrated the city's tenuous connection to the gold rush. But the Edmonton route was still not the very worst. That title is a tie between two routes that start on the south side of Alaska and went north over glaciers in the hope of hooking up with rivers that flowed north into the Yukon River. Some promoters boosted the Valdez route, which involved slogging up and over the massive Valdez Glacier, some 400 miles or 600 kilometers northwest of Skagway in the main part of Alaska. Its boosters charted a route to the Klondike through the Alaskan wilderness and back into Canada to the Klondike. And it involved actually crossing over the Valdez Glacier. As with all glacier crossings, this was highly risky, especially for those without mountaineering skills, which was pretty much everybody who tried it. Horrific stories ensued of falls into deep crevasses, avalanches, snow blindness, scurvy, and parties subsisting on uncooked food since there was no wood to cook with. Even those that made it over the glacier still faced hundreds of miles of wilderness travel and some major river crossings. Even if you made it into the Yukon River watershed, the rivers you ended up on joined the Yukon River hundreds of miles downstream of Dawson City. The very worst route, however, started in Yakutat Bay and tried to go over the massive Malaspina Glacier. In theory, the route would eventually get to the Yukon River after an even longer hike than Dalton Trail. According to an account by survivor Arthur Dietz of New York, who was there with a group of 19 men, Only four of his party survived after a two-year saga. According to a book he wrote later called Mad Rush for Gold in Frozen North, the winds howled continuously and made it difficult even to speak to others. Snow blindness, crevasses, avalanches, frostbite, and starvation took their toll. Things got so bad that they were not only eating their dogs, they were eating their dogs raw. And with that, that's our quick tour of the good, the bad, and the truly awful routes to the Klondike. Even the so-called good routes represented the adventure of a lifetime, and you can see why the Stampeders of 1897 and 1898 for the rest of their lives constituted a kind of fraternity. These were the tales you could tell for years, years that may have been shortened by the hardships and disease you suffered. Nowadays, most of these routes have returned to the wilderness, and little trace of the Stampeders remains, 
I've never heard of anyone recreating the entire Edmonton to Dawson route, although intrepid paddlers have done parts of the trip, including crossing from the Mackenzie to the Yukon watersheds at Summit Lake. Meanwhile, if you drive the Alaska Highway from Fort Nelson to Watson Lake, you pass through the Liard River region that Robert Campbell and others passed through on their way to the Pelly. The trails between Telegraph Creek and Atlin in British Columbia and Teslin Lake in the Yukon are heavily overgrown. Intrepid travelers or snowmobilers may use parts of them in the winter, but they are seldom traveled. The Dalton Trail is still visible in some parts of the Yukon, and adventurous hikers will find and use parts of the trail. If you drive the Haynes Road from Haynes, Alaska, over the border towards Haynes Junction in Canada, the highway travels over a similar but slightly different route as the first part of the Dalton Trail. The White Pass, on the other hand, is now traveled by almost a million people a year, mostly sitting in a railway seat, admiring the scenery. Cruise ship passengers in Skagway do the day excursion on the White Pass and Yukon Route Railway. The train ride is a great outing, and as you rattle along the side of a steep mountain path, you can look down and wonder where the White Pass Trail used to go. The trail itself is thickly overgrown, and we haven't heard of anyone actually hiking it along its entirety. The Chilkoot Trail is still in use. The National Park Service and Parks Canada have made the U.S. and Canadian parts of the trail into a park, and a well-maintained trail runs through it, starting from Dye and ending at Bennett. There aren't any hotel tents or saloons like Tapanadi described at Sheep Camp, but there are warm-up cabins, tenting spots, and bear-proof overnight lockers for your food. It's a great experience, and we highly recommend it. You don't get the full experience of the 1898 Stampeders, since you're probably wearing Gore-Tex and only carrying a couple days of freeze-dried food, but you definitely get a sense for the scale of the challenge they faced. You can still see the ruins of the tramways and abandoned gear along the trail, as well as some spectacular scenery. It is very popular, though, and reservations are required. These days, instead of taking months, some people run the 33-mile or 53-kilometer route in just one day. Most people take three to four days. We once did the Chilkoot and then picked up our sea kayaks in Bennett and continued to Dawson, doing the whole route in about two weeks. Instead of carrying a year's worth of supplies, of course, we stopped and picked up fresh food in Whitehorse and Carmax, and some fancy coffees in Carcross. Even today with modern equipment, it still feels like an epic journey. For the bank clerks and office boys of Vancouver and New York City, it would have been doubly so. If you liked this episode, please tell a friend and rate us on Apple Podcasts. If you really liked the episode, please go to our website, which also has links and maps about this episode, and make a donation. That's klondikegoldrush.org. Even a few bucks helps cover the cost of equipment and hosting. We didn't do this podcast to get rich, but, as an old miner might say, it would be nice to make enough to get our grub steak back. From everyone at Wrangle History Unlocked, Thanks again to Pascal and Keith Halliday for letting us share this episode of their incredible series, the Klondike Gold Rush History Podcast. Look for them online wherever podcasts are streamed, or visit their website at klondikegoldrush.org.